nice and close. Don't be afraid. Let's gather in this morning. Um, I'll give you a minute if you feel like you'd like to move a little bit closer. I'll give you a minute and we'll get started. through song so let's lift our voices let's lift our hearts let's sing this with conviction this morning that we believe that Jesus died and he died for us he died in our place and that's something worth worshipping him for so let's sing this morning
This is what it says in Isaiah 53. This is speaking of Jesus. It says, He has no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. But surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's continue to sing of the wondrous cross that Jesus went to freely to take our sin, our punishment upon himself. Let's sing. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the
love so amazing. Love so amazing, so Jesus.
Jesus, we do thank you this morning. We thank you that you were obedient to your Father. We thank you that you willingly went, you walked to the cross. You willingly submitted and took the punishment for our sin that we deserved. You were beaten, you were mocked, you were scorned in our place. Lord, that our sin may be taken and dealt with, that we may be forgiven, that we may have a hope for an eternity with you, Lord, and and a life of freedom from sin and shame. Lord Jesus, we pray that our hearts will be full of gratitude this morning as we remember, as we stop and reflect, as the weight of our sin hits us again. Lord, the fact that it was our sin that took you there. Lord, let gratitude rise up in our hearts. Let worship rise up to you. For you are so worthy of all of our praise. Be glorified, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Take a seat. And as soon as it was morning the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, He delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. We're going to see a reenactment down the center aisle of Jesus walking with his cross. Please take this as an opportunity to look, think, pray, reflect on what it was for Jesus to carry the weight of our sin and to go to Calvary for us.
darkest day Christ on the road to Calvary Tried by sinful men Torn and beaten then Nailed to a cross of wood this the power of the cross Christ became sin for us to the To see the pain written on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin, every bitter thought, every evil deed. all stand. We're going to sing and thank the Lord Jesus for his blood that washes away our sin.
Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, a special welcome uh, to anyone who's here and visiting with us for the first time today. Uh, My name is Ben, and I'm one of the pastors here at City Reach West. It's my pleasure to welcome you this morning. Um, If you are here with us, um, and perhaps you got one of these, uh, these invitational cards to come along, um, you would see on the cross side, the dark side here, Um, a question there. And this question goes like this. Do you ever feel the pain of this world's brokenness and wish that God would do something about it? Well, that's going to be the subject for this morning's sermon. If you would grab your Bibles and head to Luke chapter 23 with me. Luke chapter 23. That's where we'll look at to answer this question, but this question, I'm sure, is a question that we have all had at all sorts of times and seasons in our life, this question of, if God, well, then why is there suffering in the world, and that things are just not the way that they ought to be? And even right now, if we were to look out in the world, we would see a a famine where there's chronic throughout the world, children starving to death all over this world. Then, then we look out and we see diseases and sickness that's epidemic and pandemic throughout nations and the world. And then there's the medicine that could just be given to them so easily if only people had the access to it, but they don't. And then we look at the wars of the world, the wars that right now rage around us, how there's thousands who are being killed There's millions who are being displaced, and there's billions of dollars that are being thrown into its efforts. And we can ask, where is the justice 
in all of this. But then I think what really cuts us to the core is the suffering that's much closer to home. When we think of the loved one that we just lost to cancer, or a child, a little baby who doesn't see its days out because of sickness or tragedy, or there's those who are meant to be our our loved ones, our parents, or whatever it may be, and they actually were the ones who abused us. Or there's friends that have turned their back on us and betrayed us. We all feel this. We've all had it. We're all in the same world. We're in it together. This world is full of brokenness and pain and suffering. And so if God is so good, and if he has the power to do something about all this, then the question comes, why doesn't he? Why doesn't he act in the affairs of injustice in the world? Well, the Bible gives us an answer. And the Bible gives us an answer that points us to a particular place. It points us to the cross of Jesus Christ, the cross. And that's why we're in Luke 23. I want you to look over to verse 39 now. We're going to start reading from there. We've just skip by a few parts and we've come to the place in the account of what happened to Jesus where he's been crucified but on his right hand and on his left there were two criminals who have also been crucified and so we're going to pick it up from there reading from verse 39 in Luke 23. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that we have the story about the first Good Friday right there before us for us to see and look at, to take instruction from and to know what happened so that we can know, Lord God, how to relate to you and what you meant by the cross. So, Lord, I pray that this morning you might open our eyes to see what you would have us to see and open our ears to hear what you would have us to hear. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are. It is Good Friday, and it's 2024. And we've just seen a reenactment of a man bearing his cross come past us. And even in that, though nowhere near as bloody and as desperate as Jesus, uh, we can see that there's nothing spectacular about that at all. There's nothing glorious. There's nothing astounding. There's nothing really attractive about the cross. And that's because it is, after all, a torturer's weapon. It's a torturer's weapon. It was designed to inflict maximum suffering upon its subject. You think of the nails through the hands and the feet, the spikes that would hold you there and the blood that would just pour out fresh every minute. And then you think of the crown of thorns that Jesus had to wear on his head, how it punctured the very uh, skull that has to deal with all the thinking. And as he thinks, the, the other element of the cross is that he's naked and he's ashamed. He's there open to the public reproach and to mocking and to slandering and all those things. There he is on the cross. And what's more is that he's also feeling in his chest, in his lungs, an asphyxiation as the weight crushes his chest. And then you push yourself up by the nails in your feet so that you can take a deep breath. But then you you go back down again. And this is the, the torturousness of the cross. So how could this symbol then 
This symbol of suffering be God's answer to all the injustice in the world. And I want to give us three reasons from the text that we read this morning, three reasons why the cross answers the injustice in the world. And the first reason I want to give is that because at the cross, we see who's truly responsible. Have a look in the very first verse, 39. The criminal, the first criminal, he says, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. What's he saying here? You see, He's, he's saying, don't you have the power to end your suffering? Can't you just stop it all? Can't you just take yourself down off the cross, get rid of the bleeding and the nails and everything, and while you're at it, come and save us too, because we're in it with you as fellow condemned criminals. That was his perspective, but, but it's a perspective, mind you, that doesn't really want the justice of God. It doesn't really want it. it It wants to try and dodge and skirt around the fact that we indeed are the ones who are responsible for the injustices in the world because of our sin, our personal sin. We can convince ourselves that God owes us a world that's free from suffering, that that it's somehow our right that there should be no injustice in this world, but then we go right along and we do the very things that cause the injustice in the world. We lie and we cheat and we steal and we backbite and we commit adultery. We do all these things that actually cause the injustices in the world. Now God, when he made the world, he of course made it perfect. He saw what he had made and he said, behold, it is very good. It was a green and a luscious garden. There was no thorns, or th- there was nothing wrong. And he placed man and woman in the garden, gave them everything that they wanted to have with one prohibition. And we might remember the story. They took of the fruit and they ate it. And so it wasn't God who introduced injustice to the world. It was man. The Bible says that sin It came into the world through one man, and that was Adam. And death came through sin. And so death spread to all because all have sinned. So we can't blame God, but we can't blame Adam and Eve either for all the injustices in the world because while they may have got the ball rolling, it of course is us who continue, all have sinned, who continue to add to the pile of injustice in the world, of all the brokenness that we see. Now, what we do then is, in our nature, we don't want to hear that. And so we try and minimize, we excuse, we, we lessen the impact of our sin. And what we do is we call it by different names. When we lie, we, we say, oh, that wasn't a lie, that was a white lie. You know, we try and minimize it. Or we say to ourselves when we want revenge on someone else, We say, that's just, you know, returning the favor. Doesn't that sound lovely? I was just returning the favor. That's a positive spin on on an evil. But then we can do it with sexual immorality too. We can say, well, that's just me uh, fulfilling my needs. My physical needs need to be met. But God calls it sexual immorality. See, to God, all these things that we do bring death and destruction upon his good created world that he has made. And so sin is, first of all, an injustice against God, the righteous God who made heaven and earth. The Bible says that God is a righteous judge and a God who feels hot anger every day. This is how he feels. I wonder if you've ever thought, how does God feel about the injustice in the world? The Bible says he feels hot anger every day. He cares about the injustices in the world. And this is why the Bible then says that the reward for our sin, what we get for our sin, what God will deliver to us for our sin is death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. This is how serious God holds the injustices that we commit. And so if we want to cry out to God, why don't you fix All the injustice in the world, we're asking for more than we want to bargain for. Because if God were to give us justice, 
truly give us justice, then he would need to wipe out the entire human race. That would be justice. But he doesn't do that. Not today anyway. But I will remind us that he did once upon a time. It was 4,000 years ago roughly that God told a man to build a big boat because he was going to send a flood upon the earth to wipe out all mankind. And the Bible says this. This is how God saw it and looked at it. It says in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, that the Lord saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Do you see? He was ready for justice to be done, but it, it grieved him to his heart that we would get to such a place. And so what did the Lord do? That verse continues to say, So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the earth. And he did the flood. That's justice. If we want to call out to God for justice, we are asking for more than we want to bargain for. But at the cross, we see that God had a more full and ready plan that was going to solve the issue totally. Because as soon as Noah and all his family got off the ark, the same spiral just continued all over again. It wasn't the answer. He needed another answer, and he had planned it from eternity past, and it was at the cross that we see it come to pass. See, it's at the cross that God lays the responsibility of man square at our feet, and of woman too, square at your feet. And he says, this is what is due to you for your sin. And this is why in verse 41 of our text, if you look at what the second criminal says to the first, he says, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? What he's saying is that your perspective is totally backwards. Your perspective is all wrong. And this is why Jesus doesn't answer the first thief. He doesn't answer him. You see, there is the thief, and he's naked and he's exposed. He's nailed to a cross for his crime. And he demands that God give him an answer. But it is not God that needs to answer man. It is man that would be responsible to God for the injustices of the world. And this is where it comes home to us as well. For though I'm speaking about two criminals 2,000 years ago, we are all sinners who have all fallen short of God's glory, and we are also responsible for the, each injustice that we add to the pile. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 says that no creature, that's you and me, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. See, the cross tells us that God takes sin and injustice seriously and that he cares a whole lot more than we do about it. And so the wisest thing that we can do is come humbly and in repentance. That means to change your mind, to come in that way like a little child and admit that we are indeed responsible for the sins of the world, that we are indeed a sinner. But the only reason that that is wise is because of the second reason that the cross gives to us for the answer as to why and what God has done for the injustice of the world. And the second reason is this, that at the cross, not only do we see who's responsible, but we see who indeed then took the punishment for the injustice committed in the world. Notice what it says in verse 41 with the second criminal. He goes on to say that we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. See, Jesus is a sinless saviour. And he's 33 years old as he's on the cross. And if we were to relate ourselves to that and think, how many sins might we commit in 33 years? Well, if you just did one sin a day for 33 years, 
you would have 12,000, over 12,000 sins that are piled up on your record to which you must give an account to God for. Over 12,000. But Jesus, he's lived those 33 years and he has a whole zip, zero. He's sinless. He's perfect. See, he's a good man. Now, a lot of people say that Jesus is a good man, and that's right, and I want to make this point. He's a good man that during his life, he went about from town to town, and he, he healed the sick, and he raised the dead, and he fed the hungry, and he taught the greatest ethics class that the world has ever known on the Sermon on the Mount. He even proclaimed that there was a kingdom coming and that there was a way that we could enter it. There was no one who disputed that he was a, a good man. And even at the end of his life, when he stood before Herod and Pontius Pilate, the two governors of uh, the city of Jerusalem at that time, those who had jurisdiction to judge, when they examined him, they couldn't find anything at all to charge him with. And neither could even the very people who had brought him to the tribunal, the religious party. They couldn't find anything wrong with him either. They were giving him up over out of jealousy, and that's what we read in, in Mark earlier, when Jack read it out, that, that um, you know, the, they gave him up over because of jealousy. They couldn't find anything wrong. His deeds were righteous, but theirs were evil. That's why they gave him up. And neither could the disciples, his very own close friends, find anything wrong with Jesus. Peter the Apostle, he wrote saying that of Jesus, he committed no sin, neither was there any deceit found in his mouth. But ultimately, regardless of what all they said, all those said, God himself couldn't find anything wrong with the life of Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He was a good man. Now, I thank God that he was a man because a man is what is necessary to pay for the sins of mankind. See, in those days, they would sacrifice bulls and goats and shed their blood and want the blood of a bull and a goat to somehow cover their sins to make them right before God. But the Bible says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to deal with sins, to take them away. And so we can, even today, still try and do that sort of a thing, try and cover up our sins in other ways. You know, we do good deeds or something like that to try and outweigh our bad deeds. It doesn't work. I heard of a woman who would go to her backyard and she would dig a hole and she would lie down over the hole and then she would speak all of her guilt into the earth and then cover the hole back up. And what this is is just a desperate attempt at trying to find a way to rid ourselves of our own personal guilt. But we all know that it doesn't work, that nothing else will work apart from a sacrificial substitute, blood that can cover our sins because it's perfect blood that matches the price that we need to pay as our own blood is due for the penalty of sin. We need man's blood to cover the sins of men. And so Jesus is that perfect sinless substitute. And that is what God provided for us at the cross. Here's where the cross shows us our substitute. But I want to go on further and not just say that Jesus is a good man, but that Jesus is a God man. For this is the part that is a dividing line for many. It's not enough to say that Jesus is a good man. He is a God man. In Mark chapter 15, verse 39, we're at the cross again. Here we are, and there's a centurion. And he stands and he's looking at the cross and he sees Jesus on it. And Jesus, we read elsewhere, he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he gives up his spirit. He releases it himself. And the centurion looks at that and he says these words, truly this man was the son of God. See, what the centurion saw at the cross was Jesus having complete control over his death. Crucifixion was meant to last for days. Remember, it was a torturous method. Days and days they were meant to feel the agony of it. But Jesus was only there for six hours. Six hours he hung there. And this was proof enough to a, a battle-hardened soldier that this man had control over his death, that this wasn't natural. Even in his death, Jesus proved that he was the Son of God. 
Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 18, that no one, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. And this charge I received from my Father. See, it was the Father's will to offer up his only Son, as the sacrifice for the sins of the world. And we're reminded that Jesus didn't go kicking and screaming, that this was actually his will also. He submitted himself to the will of his loving Father. We might remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before Jesus goes to the cross, he's on the floor praying and he asks the Father, would you take this cup from me? Would you let it pass by? What he means is the suffering, the agony, the cross that's about to come, Is there any other way that I can redeem mankind, that I can save the sins, uh, that I can pay for the sins of the whole world? Is there any other way? And the Father says, no, there's not. You must go through with it. And he submits his will to the Father's, and off he goes to the cross. The Father loved, and the Son loved the whole world. And this is what John 3.16 says, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. See, what kind of love gives up your only son? Your only son. I'm a father of four children, and and I can tell you that if someone told me that I needed to give up one of my children in order to save the life of a criminal, I couldn't do it. I wouldn't have it in me. There's no way I couldn't bear the thought of having to hand over my child Even just one of them, I have four. But Jesus was the only begotten son of the Father. He's his only son. And such love does God have for the world that he gave up his only son. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says that God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us. We were criminals when God gave up his son. We weren't worthy of it. We weren't uh, special or righteous. We weren't in a position to expect that God would do such a thing, but God's love is so great that he gave up his son even while we were far from him in our sin. And so it is that at the cross, when we look at the cross again, we see the greatest answer that God gives to that question, why suffering? What are you doing about it, God? Well, at the cross, we see the justice of God meet the love of God. We see the justice meet the love. It's like they kiss together at the cross. If you can think of the the vertical and the horizontal, there they are on the cross. His love and his justice meet. For it is the justice of God that would destroy the whole world because of our sin. But it is the love of God that says, not yet. I am going to provide a way. I'm going to give opportunity. I want to provide a substitutionary sacrifice so that anyone who would put their trust in him might not have to experience my justice and might know relationship with me. See, this is God's offer of salvation to you today. This is what Good Friday is all about. It's the day where a holy and a righteous God who cannot tolerate sin, he bridged the great divide by making a way for us to be reconciled back to him. And the call to you today is to repent of your sin and to trust in Jesus Christ for forgiveness. Believe that what Jesus did at the cross is your only hope and your only remedy. Today is the day that if you've never done it before, Get right with God. Call on him. Plead the blood of Jesus and know the forgiveness that's in his name. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And I wonder if that's how you feel this morning, weary and burdened and tired of searching the world over for that satisfaction of your soul and you're just weary. Jesus says, come to me and you'll find rest for your souls. Come to Jesus. Don't put it off. 
The Bible says that today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today is the day of salvation. You may never have the same opportunity as you do today to come to Jesus Christ, where his offer is so clearly open for you today to know the forgiveness of sins. Don't put it off. Come to the cross. Come to Jesus. Now, I must go on to that very third reason why the cross is God's answer to injustice. And it's this, that at the cross... Not only do we see who's responsible for the injustice of the world, not only do we see who took the punishment for the injustices of the world, but we also see a precious and beautiful promise of God, of paradise, of an eternal paradise. Look in verse 42. The criminal, the second one, he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And look what Jesus says. He said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. See, it's been 2,000 years since that very first Good Friday, 2,000 years since Jesus said those words. And since then, it can seem to us that all the injustices of the world continue on as they ever have been since before the cross as though nothing really changed, as though what I'm telling you is a lie, that the cross didn't, in fact, deal with all the injustices of the world. But in this statement of the thief, remember me when you come into your kingdom, we see that there is, in fact, a day coming when Jesus Christ will establish a perfect kingdom in righteousness and in justice. He's going to rule the earth. And, and this current time that we live in, these 2,000 years, what they have been is a day of patience of God towards us sinners. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. This is what the Apostle Peter wrote, that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. He's not slow. He's patient towards us. He's opening the invitation for 2,000 years saying, come to the cross, come to my son, because there is a day coming where I will send him back on a white horse instead of a donkey with righteousness and justice, and he will establish a perfect kingdom. And if you don't come to him by that time, you will be left on the outside. You'll be cut off and separated from me forever. And that is the second death. There is a first death that we experience. It's a separation of our spirit from our body. But there is a second death that the Bible speaks of, which is a separation of your spirit from God. You're cut off from the life of God forever. And he doesn't want that for anyone. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And so at the cross, we can see, along with this criminal, with eyes of faith, a day when, according to that final book in the Bible, Revelation, we can see this. John is speaking and he says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning or crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. The paradise of God where Jesus says, behold, I am making all things new. The promise of God to us today, before that time, is that if anyone is in Christ, he is, she is, a new creation. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus today. And that's why Jesus could promise it to that criminal today. And so again, today if you hear his voice, Come to the Lord Jesus. Come in repentance. Come in humility and accept what he has done for you on the cross as your forgiveness, as your salvation, and as the promise of paradise with him. Would you all bow your heads with me? Because I want to give us an opportunity, if there's anyone here in the room who's not ever known this love of God, the forgiveness of sins, and the promise of eternal paradise, I want to give you an opportunity in a moment to pray a prayer along with me. 
Now, if you've heard me clearly, then it's as simple as trusting in Jesus and your sins can be forgiven. But I want to ask you, will you be like that first criminal who railed at Jesus and got no answer from him? Or will you be like the second who saw, even at the cross, a glory of Jesus Christ, who came in humility, who came with faith and said, Jesus, remember me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, will you be those who hear those precious words of Jesus? Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I want to pray and lead you in that if that's something you want to commit to this very day. You can pray something like this. Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I am responsible for every injustice and sin that I have contributed to the pile of all the world. And Lord, I acknowledge that I deserve your justice to fall on me, to be separated from you forever. But God, I see now what you have done for me at the cross, where your son bled and died to shed his blood to wash away my sin, that I might have forgiveness with you. God, I repent of my sin, and I trust in Jesus for the first time. And now, God, I ask that you would keep me in this faith until the very last day that you've given to me. And I thank you for the promise of paradise with you forever. And Father, I pray that you will now help me to make my faith public and tell someone of the decision that I've made today and of the grace that you've given me today. Amen. Resolve to know nothing but you crucify. Somehow in this room right now, it is enough. The weight of the world, too much for the souls of men, but somehow you hold it all up on the cross.
We're going to respond to what we've heard this morning and bow our knee at the cross of Jesus Christ.
sing with me. Worthy is the Lamb Seated on the throne Crowned you now with many crowns You reign victorious I lift Yes, Father, our Holy Father and our Holy God, we praise you, Lord, and we sing, Worthy is the Lamb, our Lord Jesus, who was slain. For his blood has ransomed to you, has bought to you, has purchased for you a people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language, Lord, and that here we are in Adelaide, a part of that great number, praising your name. So Father, thank you for Jesus and for the cross, which is where that blood was shed. Father, I want to pray, Lord, and ask truly for anyone who might have for the first time put their trust in you today, to put their trust in your son, that you might seal on their hearts, Lord, your goodwill toward them in keeping them safe to the very end. Lord, that they would remember that there is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. I pray, Lord, that they would 
wonder at your love and grow in it, that as they come to look at what they've believed, see your love poured out for them on Jesus, with Jesus on the cross, that they would grow up in that and only marvel at you more. And so become, Lord, um, wonderful children of yours who praise your name every day. So keep them and secure them. And Father, I pray again that you would help them to make their faith public and tell the world about what they have come to find in Jesus Christ. And Lord, for all those who do know you, Lord, and have known you for a number of years or months, we ask, Lord, that you would help us only grow in this knowledge of your love for us. Turn us more and more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, and help us Remember that this message that comes on Good Friday is the message that changes the whole world, that is what is the power at work in us to change us each and every day also. And so, Lord, please use us. Bless us, help us as we seek to honour and glorify your name till the day when we stand in your presence and see you face to face. Amen. Well, it really has been a pleasure, um, a privilege to open up the Word of God with you and to see you all here this morning and worship with you here this morning. Uh, again, I do encourage you, um, perhaps chat to the person next to you about what you've heard today and do reach out to someone if uh, you perhaps came alone and uh, have heard about Jesus for the very first time today. May the Lord bless you. Sally's just said, invite you back for Sunday. See something on the screen there? So Sunday, of course, we're going to be meeting as usual. So come along on Sunday and invite anyone else that you'd like to see there too. So God bless.